All right, folks, so today we're gonna to finish up our conversation on the cluster B personality uh, disorder. So uh, in part one, if you didn't see that video, uh, go ahead and go back and watch it. But in that video, we talked about uh, antisocial and borderline personality disorders, uh, which again are two of the most uh, talked about, two of the most uh, well-known personality disorders uh, amongst all 10 of them. And so uh, there are two other disorders in this cluster. So I, I obviously wanted to talk about those a little bit separately given the seriousness uh, of the antisocial and the borderline personality disorder. But uh, they do share this cluster with two other personality disorders, uh, that being histrionic and narcissistic personality disorders. Now, um, narcissistic is something that most people have uh, probably also heard of. It's probably... <clears throat> again, one of the most uh, well-known personality disorders. Uh, but histrionic, which is uh, where we're gonna start, is probably something uh, that has gotten less attention and, and, and thereby is probably uh, less well-known. So what is histrionic personality disorder? Um, histrionic personality disorder, a histrionic personality, uh, is one that really just craves attention. Uh, it's nice to talk about this particular disorder in conjunction uh, with narcissistic personality disorder because they really do share a lot of features even though there is a pretty clear difference uh, between the two disorders. So again, with the histrionic personality, the folks, the, the people that, that have this type of uh, disorder or have traits of this disorder, uh, they tend to just want to be in the spotlight. They tend to do a lot of things to get attention on themselves. They tend to do a lot of things to make sure uh, that they are seen. The important thing to know about the histrionic personality in particular uh, is that this per personality disorder in terms of wanting to get attention doesn't care, usually doesn't care uh, if that attention is positive or that attention is negative. Um, this, this, uh, the example I'm thinking of uh, is like a kid who's, you know, acting up in class um, and even that negative attention is, is something that he, uh, it, he or she would be seeking, right? So the kid's acting up in class and the, and the, and the teacher is uh, getting on them every time he does that and so he is enjoying that attention in some way. Now that's not a great example of a histrionic personality to, to be clear, uh, but it is just an example of how someone can crave or be fed by both positive uh, or negative attention. So uh, let's look at the diagnostic criteria of the histrionic personality and then we'll talk a little bit uh, more about it and then I'll point you to some examples. <clears throat> so uh, this is on page 667 of your DSM and histrionic personality disorder is a pervasive pattern of excessive emotionality and attention seeking beginning by early adulthood and present in a variety of contexts as indicated by five or more of the following. Uh, again, so uh, excessive emotionality and attention seeking. Uh, one thing I guess I haven't made clear is that in addition to this uh, attention seeking, as they're saying, they tend to be really dramatic. Uh, this particular cluster, right, is called the dramatic and erratic cluster. Uh, the histrionic personality uh, is definitely the, <laughs> I'm gonna say the queen of uh, dramatic personality, right? Uh, narcissism wants to be a close second, but uh, histrionic definitely takes the cake in this regard. So in addition to that attention seeking, one of the ways, and these two things are gonna feed off of each other, one of the ways that they're gonna do that is by being really dramatic, being really emotional, um, not in the same way that the borderline is, but uh, sometimes they can approach that type of uh, that type of behavior that draws you in, that draws you back uh, in, in kind of a negative situation in a negative context. If you don't do X, Y, and Z, I'm going to right, hurt myself. I'm going to smash your car. I'm going to tell um, your friends that secret you didn't want me to tell them. Right? So <clears throat> they, will, they will also use these type of dramatic lures uh, to get people to notice them, to get people to pay attention to them. Uh, though they don't tend to take it to the to the ends that the borderline does. So uh, as we go through this list, I'm gonna check to make sure, uh, but you, you aren't likely to see, you aren't going to see um, 
that one of the criteria here, for instance, is suicidality or suicide ideation uh, in the same way that it is for the borderline, again, who's willing to cross that line uh, to get what they want. The histrionic tends to have um, better boundaries and <laughs> uh, that's gonna be funny uh, once you see some of these examples. So, uh, number one, uh, is uncomfortable in situations in which he or she is not the center of attention. So there again, you have that kind of hallmark of the disorder. That is to say the one criteria that we generally expect to see in most cases, and that usually serves to kind of set up uh, what's going on with the disorder broadly. So is uncomfortable in situations in which he or she uh, is not the center of attention. Um, one of the examples that I'm going to give you that's uh, it's, it's always tricky when you're dealing with a character, uh, but a good example of this is Michael Scott from The Office. Um, there are, so you can find some videos online, and I, I think I've had students in the past do uh, histrionic and Michael Scott as one of the projects for these papers. Uh, but if you just if you are used to watching The Office and you can think of any of those meeting scenes, right? Uh, Michael Scott loves to be the center of attention. He loves giving those meetings, uh, even though it's kind of clear that the rest of his employees hate hate those meetings, right? He's always excited. Conference room, right? He's always excited uh, to be able to stand up and talk to his uh, employees in that way and kind of be the center of attention. Uh, and if you ever see episodes where they're having a conference meeting uh, and Michael is not the one leading the meeting, you will see him uh, either be visibly uncomfortable or eventually just get up and take the meeting uh, back over. So that kind of sense of uh, seeing somebody sitting in a room where there's a lot of people and eyes are on someone else. Uh, and in the case of a histrionic personality, you're going to expect them to be uncomfortable. And that discomfort is going to feel like, I want to get up and say something. I want people to hear what I have to say. I want people looking at me, right? This type of thing, this type of discomfort. So, uh, number two, <clears throat> interactions with others interaction with others is often characterized by inappropriate, sexually seductive, or provocative behavior. Uh, so again, this is one of those things that a histrionic person will generally uh, be using to get attention, and, and that is to say to get eyes on them. Uh, whether or not they are actually sexually promiscuous is Actually, something I don't have data on, that would be maybe an interesting uh, piece for somebody to build into their paper or just let me know by email. Um, but they will use their sexuality as a way to just get eyes on them. They will use uh, sexuality to get attention, uh, either in a one-on-one -on -one situation or, um, and you're going to see a great example of this uh, in, in some of the video links I give you, or by showing up uh, to, say, a party or to uh, an event or over to somebody's house or somewhere in public, right, and just wearing something that's uh, really inappropriate or saying something that's really inappropriate as just a way to get people to look at them, right? Even if what they're saying is, oh my God, I can't believe what he's wearing. Oh my God, I can't believe she said that. Um, that still is attention, right? That kid in the classroom who doesn't care how the teacher um, is paying attention to them as long as they're getting noticed, right? The histrionic personality is going to um, feel that same way about saying, somebody saying, oh my God, I can't believe uh, X, Y, or Z. <clears throat> so, uh, number three, uh, displays rapidly shifting and shallow expressions of emotion. Uh, this is a pretty uh, similar trait to what you would expect to see uh, in a borderline personality. Um, but here, it's not a quick shifting emotionality that goes from really loving to, to hating, right? It's not that idealization and then the devaluation necessarily. Uh, generally, this is going to be um, you walk into a room and you're really sad that this person is really sad um, and they notice that everyone's having a good time and nobody's paying them attention because they're really sad and suddenly they're really happy and excited and vibrant and oh my god everybody look at me again right and and then maybe you know they walk into a different situation and they're really excited or they're content or whatever it is and um, you know, somebody over in the corner is really upset and everybody's crowded around them, comforting them. Well, guess what? Now I'm going to be really upset because that seems to be a way to get attention. Or I might do something different. I might go over and, you know, I'm a counselor. I know how to handle this. Everybody watch, right? And so just anything to get attention, you might see that their emotions will kind of shift over or will quickly switch to, to, to be the thing, to do the thing. 
uh, that will get them attention. Um, Another quick example, right, just thinking again of Michael Scott, right? Sometimes he comes in to the room really vibrant and nobody pays him attention. And then he gets really upset and mad and slams the door and goes to his office. And somebody, usually Pam or Jim, right, will go in and say, oh, my God, what's wrong, Michael? What's going on? Right? That same type of thing, that, that quick shifting of emo emotion. It's almost like there's this barometer that they have of reading the room to see What's going to get people to notice me most here? Do I need to be upset? Do I need to be sexual? Do I need to be angry? Do I need to be exciting? Right? Whatever it is, as long as people <clears throat> are paying attention to me. Number four, uh, and this kind of goes along with number two, consistently using, uh, number four, consistently uses physical presence to draw physical appearance. Uh, to draw attention to themselves. So that might go right along with the sexually seductive stuff, but it might also look like wearing something uh, ridiculous, right? So you can imagine, uh, say there's a histrionic student in one of my classes and they show up. <laughs> this actually happened, I don't think the guy's histrionic. Um, he said he was doing an experiment, but uh, say they show up one day wearing a horse head uh, costume, right? just as a way to get people to say, hey, what's going on with you? Or just to laugh at the, you know, when you walk in the room, uh, whatever it is, right? So they might use their appearance. They, they tend to use, I should say, uh, their appearance to draw attention to themselves. That might again go along with the sexually seductive stuff, uh, but it might just be something weird or dramatic or outlandish uh, that just get people to notice um, and talk about them. Number five, uh, has a style of speech that is excessively impressionistic and lacking in detail. Um, this is kind of similar to what we saw in the schizotypical, schizotypical, I feel like I'm saying that wrong, uh, schizotypal uh, personality disorder. Uh, that is to say, um, sort of just speaking differently is a way to get people to notice you, right? And so you'll see folks uh, with a histrionic personality maybe sometimes uh, speak in different accents or uh, just speak in wild or, you know, uh, you know, just a different speaking voice, maybe really high or I'm going to talk really low or something like that, right? Just to get people to go, why are you speaking like that? Or, oh, you, your voice, if they don't know you, oh, your voice is so interesting. I love that accent, whatever it is. Again, just doing all of these kind of things to change about themselves uh, as a way to get people to see them, to notice, to pay attention. Number six, shows self-dramatization theatricality and exaggerated expressions of emotion. So again, this type tends to be really dramatic. And so here it is where we will see that, you know, on the day to day, what you usually see with this type of personality is that they do just tend to be dramatic. They tend to do things in big ways. They tend to overemphasize and, you know, just be kind of a, a, a drama queen in, in the room. Uh, and so, <clears throat> Everything that they do, or a lot of the things that they do, will be overblown, will be overly expressive. You know, people will say, yeah, that's exciting, man, but, you know, calm down. Again, thinking of Michael Scott, he's just such a good example. Uh, thinking of Michael Scott, right, and him just, just being overly excited, overly exuberant about certain things that maybe everyone else in the office is excited about, but here he kind of just takes it to this different level. And again, it's a way to get, you know, if everybody's excited, I have to be way up here so that I'm still the one that people are, are noticing or talking about. Number seven um, is suggestible. That is easily influenced by others or circumstances. So, uh, a similar, this is something that's happening again unconsciously, and there is again some similarity here to the borderline personality where they're really being amorphous in terms of what it is that they uh, are such that people will pay attention to them. Uh, and so, that looks like them being suggestible. Hey, wouldn't it be funny if you ate this whole, you know, this whole pile of dirt? Everybody come look, Michael's going to eat this dirt, right? That's suggestible in a way, right? They're doing it for the attention, um, but it's not the same as the borderline who's, who's, you know, just shifting to keep people with them in this, you know, frantic effort. It's really more like, yeah, I'll eat that. Everybody come look, watch this, you know, there's nothing to me. Uh, there tends to be, uh, and we're going to talk about this next, but there also tends to be sort of this touch of narcissism that, that you experience, that you feel with them. But again, um, good attention, bad attention, either one will, will work just fine. And then lastly, uh, number eight, this is a strange one, uh, 
but in the experiences that I've had and the research that I've done, this does uh, seem to be something that stands out, even though that it doesn't kind of fit uh, with the rest of the criteria. Number eight, considers relationships to be more intimate than they actually are. So it's almost like they believe the attention that they're getting. It's, it's almost like the person with histrionic personality doesn't really get that people are just paying them attention almost the way you pay a clown attention. And I don't mean like an actual clown, but you know, stop being a clown, uh, like a class clown, right? Um, and so when they see people, and a piece of this really is uh, defining what the disorder is or how it works psychologically, but when they see people paying them that attention, they really do experience that as some type of intimacy, some type of connection. Oh, they really like me. Oh, they must really think I'm great. I think you're great too, mostly because you're paying me attention. Uh, that's in parentheses, but mostly because you're paying me attention. But man, we really get each other, right? And, and you can see this again, Michael Scott. You can see this with Michael Scott, right? He thinks he's best friends with all these people. Um, and, and most of them can sort of take him or leave him. I mean, not that he doesn't have friends, but um, he often thinks that he's really close. And you often see him, for instance, especially uh, getting into some type of relationship. Uh, and immediately thinking, oh, we're going to be together forever. I should probably propose to her. I know this is the second date, but I definitely, I definitely know this is the one, right? Uh, one of the things that we tend to see, so that's all eight. One of the things that we tend to see with the histrionic personality, um, and one of the things that uh, I have surmised is uh, to do with their history, sorry for the uh, like words, is that maybe these were kids, right? And just kind of theorizing with you. Maybe these were kids um, who didn't get attention from their parents or from their teacher or from their loved ones unless they were doing something big, right? Unless they were getting in trouble at school, unless they were winning the talent show, unless they were standing in front of grandma and grandpa and doing a little dance or something, right? That the parents really seem to value uh, or what the parents really seem to value in the child um, to the exclusion of other things, right? There, there's going to be, uh, similar to the antisocial and to the borderline, there's going to be some uh, severe, and I don't necessarily mean that in terms of uh, abusive, but just kind of way over here, right? Some severe, some si significant or extreme uh, type of childhood that would create this type of personality. Uh, and so my estimation is that this tends to come from uh, a kid who learned from his parents that the way to get love and that love is attention, the way to get love is to make sure that eyes are on you. My parents aren't loving me unless I'm doing something wild, unless I'm, again, winning the talent show or at least, you know, they're picking me up from juvie or something like that. Otherwise, they don't pay me any attention. And I begin to think that attention is love, right? I begin to connect those things. And so you get this last uh, criteria here uh, where when people are paying you any amount of attention, that feels like uh, some sort of love. And so you say, oh, we're really connected. And, and the person may be connected to you, but they may also say, no, I just think you're really funny, man. Or I just, you know, thought you were really hot in that dress that you wore to this uh, formal event, right? So um, <clears throat> this is uh, the histrionic personality. And uh, one thing that I really want to stress again is the difference between uh, or, or that they really prefer any type of attention, whether that be positive or negative. And that's going to look really, really different when we start thinking about the types of attention and they do like it that the narcissist wants. Okay, so narcissism. Now this is one that again, most folks have uh, heard of, whether uh, clinically or just maybe uh, calling somebody or calling a political figure, uh, maybe uh, that, that term, right? So maybe narcissism is something that you've heard of, uh, but I of course wanna make sure that we understand what narcissistic personality disorder uh, really looks like and what the traits and features of that are. Um, to start out, one thing I, I do wanna say about narcissism, um, is that I feel like it's getting sort of a bad rap recently. Not that it doesn't deserve it in, in some respects, but I think it's getting a worse rap than it, it really deserves. 
uh, one of the things I continue to see online, um, and not even necessarily, I, I haven't really found this, I might be wrong, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I haven't seen this in any real research articles. Uh, but one thing I see talked about in kind of pop psychology circles uh, is this idea of a malignant narcissist, a malignant narcissism. Um, and this malignant narcissism, to my ear, really sounds like either fully an antisocial personality disorder or some mixed features of a narcissist and antisocial personality. I think it's important to distinguish those two things, of course, just for um, clinical reasons, but, but also just to understand uh, that narcissism doesn't have these antisocial traits usually, or at least in a kind of clean cut case, it doesn't have these uh, sort of malignant features that you hear talked about um, mostly on the internet. So um, first let's just take a look at what narcissistic personality disorder is, uh, and then I'll speak a little bit more on why I don't see this uh, kind of malignance, this malignancy, I guess, um, that, that a lot of people are trying to attach to it. So uh, narcissistic personality disorder is a pervasive pattern, this is on page 669, it's a pervasive pattern of grandiosity in fantasy or behavior. So I'm amazing in my head or I'm amazing in terms of how I act like I am. So a uh, pattern of grandiosity in fantasy or behavior, need for admiration and lack of empathy, interesting, beginning by early adulthood and present in a variety of contexts as indicated by five or more of the following. Number one, has a grandiose sense of self, excuse me, has a grandiose sense of self-importance uh, such that they exaggerate achievements and talents and they expect to be recognized as superior without commiserate achievements. So they expect to be recognized as superior without commiserate achievements. That's one of the things that, I, that really sticks in my head uh, about the narcissist. Of course, here we have, again, that first uh, criteria, really setting up what it is, right? And grandiosity, wanting to be admired, uh, these type of things. But in particular, connecting this idea of uh, narcissists wanting those things without any commiserate achievements, right? I just want to be respected. I just want you to like me and to tell me that I'm great and that I'm awesome. Well, what have you done to deserve that? just do it. It's me, right? So uh, narcissists just expect to be uh, admired and loved. Number two, uh, is preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty, or ideal love. So um, you'll see them set up like, oh, I can't wait to get this huge, gorgeous mansion, or I'm gonna have the most beautiful wife, and we're gonna have the most beautiful children, and we're gonna drive the best cars, and my kids are gonna go to Harvard, right? They will have the sense that their life is going to go in this really perfect and fantastic and grandiose, of course, uh, way. Uh, and of course, they will be preoccupied with that. That will be their goal uh, and almost their main pro primary ambition in life. Number three, uh, believes that he or she is special and unique and can only be understood or should associate with other special or high status people or institutions. Uh, so what you're going to see with regard to this is that narcissists will really judge other folks in terms of how successful or how beautiful or how you know whatever it is maybe funny maybe whatever uh that that person is and they're only going to want to be around people that they think um are as awesome as they are or, or close to it. or in some cases and usually this is the reason behind it is to elevate their own status right i want to hang out with you because you're famous and rich and everybody knows you and i want to be connected to that i want to go to harvard and i want my kids to go to harvard because that's just the best university and we deserve the best of course and so you're going to see them really say that I'm, I'm not going to associate with things that I think are beneath me I'm not going to associate with people that I think are beneath me and so here's where you start to get some of that lack of empathy but it is sort of a selected lack of empathy. It's not like the antisocial personality where it's just off for them. Uh, this is one where only certain people deserve it, 
right? And all, and usually those people are as awesome as I am or can help me uh, be more awesome. So uh, again, there, there isn't the same, you know, everybody is uh, in my way. Some people are probably helpful to you. Some people are probably uh, gonna help you get higher and better and uh, more noticed. So a uh, narcissist is different uh, in that way than the antisocial personality. Number four requires, this was a short one, requires excessive admiration, right? So this person, you know, you'd think for somebody who thinks really highly of himself that they wouldn't necessarily need uh, this type of admiration for people to continually tell them uh, how good they are, how great they are. But what you find with the narcissist is that they tend to need that. They tend to constantly need that reinforcement uh, from other people. This might be people in their life uh, more and more. This is possible with the internet, right? How many likes can I get? How many people will comment um, on my Instagram post uh, or whatever? Uh, but whatever it is, whichever way they're getting it, they will want that admiration. Uh, now, take us back. I want to take us back to the histrionic personality who also uh, wants that attention, but for them, it doesn't have to be admiration, right? For the histrionic personality, again, they don't care if that's bad attention or good attention, whereas for the narcissist, they want to be admired. They want people to look up at them and say, oh my gosh, how great that person is. How great that person, how great is that person? Um, and they're not going to tolerate, they're not going to tolerate people uh, that either don't do that, don't do that enough, or certainly anybody who's going to insult them or tell them that they're not great or they're doing something wrong or there's a problem here, right? Uh, one of the reasons, I'm jumping around a little bit, but one of the reasons um, that narcissists aren't going to take it to the malignant level, uh, malignant level that the antisocial personality will is because there is this piece of them, despite them always needing that admiration, there still is this piece of them that feels like they're, they are great and they are special. Um, and so if somebody is in their way or if somebody is not admiring them, peace out like they they're not gonna try to hurt this person they're not like the borderline gonna try to draw them back in in a frantic way they're just gonna say that's cool uh, this other person over here think will think i'm great and so all these other people you're just the only one who doesn't think i'm great so you know <laughs> get out uh, so they're not going to have this way of wanting to turn on people or wanting to hurt them uh, because they're not getting this attention uh, that they want they're just going to dismiss you Okay, well, bye, and I'll find somebody else who will uh, pay me that attention, who will admire me the way that I want to be admired. Number five, has a sense of entitlement, uh, that is, unreasonable expectations of especially favorable treatment or automatic compliance with his or her expectations. So uh, again, they're in charge. People are just going to do what they want, and if you're not going to uh, do what I want, you know, my way or the highway. Number six, is interpersonally exploitative. That is, takes advantage of others to achieve his or her own ends. Again, here's where they're finding it close or, or where I think some people are getting that misunderstanding about how narcissism and antisocial are different. Um, here again, this person is likely to use people. I don't want to make any uh, mistakes about it, but it won't be in the same plotting, I'm just doing this because this will get me to this thing, really it tends to be more of an emotional using. And, and there may be some, of course, byproducts of helping you get where you wanna go, and that might be what attracted the narcissist to this person in the first place. But after they're together, generally what's going on is that the narcissist is kind of feeding on the admiration, right? And so the way that it, in, in my mind, the way that it is they're using or exploiting that person is they're not necessarily going to pay back that admiration. They're not necessarily going to say, oh, you're so good at your job. They might, they might say, you're so great. We're both so great. They, you know, we're great together, uh, but they might not. They might just say, yeah, that's right. I'm good. Uh, could you please go get my coffee? Right. And so this type of exploitation, um, where they just think they're better than people. And so the people that are beneath them, they're gonna treat them like they're, they're beneath them. Um, 
again, it's not the same thing of how can I plot uh, to get to the head of this built business? Well, I just need to get so-and-so fired and tell so-and-so that his husband uh, is cheating on him. And then if I just kill the vice president, I think um, they'll elect me CEO, right? It's not that same type of thing. It's more of a, ooh, there's uh, the boss. Let me go talk to him. I bet he can get me a good job, right? Oh, you know, you like my work? I can't believe it, right? It's this type of thing. I'm going on, but it's this type of thing, right? It's one to get close to people that they think are powerful and then using that connection uh, to get higher, using that connection to elevate their own status. Um, it's not usually, I mean, there's an example of everything, but it's not usually going to go to this, uh, I'm going to hurt them or I'm going to do terrible things to them in order to get what or where I want. It's just more like um, that person could be useful to me. Let me go uh, befriend. All right, uh, number seven, uh, lacks empathy, is unwilling to recognize or identify with the feelings and needs of others. It is strange to me <laughs> that here we have a lacking of empathy in the narcissistic personality, uh, but we didn't have like that. Those words were not uh, in the antisocial as far as I remember. They sort of, you know, didn't think it's something like they can't see the pain that they cause to people or something. It didn't just say lack sympathy, but here we have lack sympathy. Um, I don't find this to be entirely true. Um, narcissists have empathy. They may have reduced empathy. May, they may lack empathy in certain situations. They may lack empathy for certain people. Uh, but in general, the narcissist isn't unempathic. In general, the narcissist can look at a situation and understand that hurt them, but they might conclude, but my feelings are more important, so it doesn't matter, right? That's not a lack of empathy, right? That's uh, that's a lack of maybe recognizing it, their own empathy or prioritizing the feelings of others, uh, but that's not just, oh, I don't know how you're feeling, right? That's not something that you would expect to find in a, in a narcissist, right? That's closer to antisocial in terms of that kind of, that true empathy of feeling it in your body um, and then we're approaching uh, maybe autistic um, spectrum when we're talking about not feeling it and then cognitively not getting it. The antisocial will cognitively get it eventually, right? Oh, I've upset them. Good. Right? Uh, but the narcissist will feel it. But then they may just say, but, I, you know, me first. So uh, so I don't, I don't like this that, they, that they've said here, right? Lack of empathy. I, I don't think that that's quite right. They do go on to say, is unwilling to recognize or identify with the feelings or needs of others. That's not a lack of empathy. If anything, it's a lack of sympathy. Right? Number eight, is often envious of others or believes that others are envious of him or her. Uh, so again, I'm great. Of course you think I'm great and you want to be like me. Uh, they're going to think that often in cases, even when that's not true, right? You're just jealous of me. Um, you just didn't show up to my thing because you didn't want to see how good I was, right? You might get some of this type of behavior uh, from them, uh, of course. But then again, in general, uh, they're going to think people are envious of them, but the folks that are around them, that they don't feel that envy, they don't feel that admiration. They're, they're really just going to, uh, get rid of, they're going to ghost them or lose their number, or maybe just tell them, Hey, you're fired. <clears throat> number nine shows arrogant, haughty, uh, behaviors or attitudes. So again, this is sort of getting it kind of close to the histrionic personality where they're, they can tend to be expressive, they can tend to be uh, dramatic. This doesn't tend to be, this isn't usually they're always on the way that it is for the histrionic. Um, whether that dramatic be upset or happy or whatever, uh, the, the narcissist is, again, going to just use this to their benefit for the, uh, for the most part. Um, they're not necessarily having these quick shifts of emotion to meet the needs uh, or to get the attention of people around them. Uh, they really tend to almost be sort of stable in their, their sense of grandiosity. Um, that said, I want to unsay it because there is this sort of weird duality going on with the narcissist. Uh, and we've talked about this already when we were talking about uh, defense mechanisms. And basically what it seems that you have with the narcissist in most cases 
um, with examples that I've seen of folks being clinically treated and, and where that treatment tends to go if the, if the narcissist can stick with it, um, is that there really is a superiority complex going on. Uh, there really is this sense that um, I think I'm great, but I deep down do know that I don't have any commiserate experiences. And so this is why I need this continued validation of my greatness, because I know I'm great, but I'm not sure. So just tell me, just tell me one more time. Okay. Say it again, right? It's this, it's this sort of, I, I, I feel great or I need to project it that I'm great, but I also have this kind of seeking feeling that I'm not very that I'm not very great or I'm not at least uh, as great as I think I am. And so again, you know, similar to that uh, superiority complex where it's almost hiding the sense of inferiority, uh, what you tend to have with a narcissist, again, thinking about how does a person get this way? Well, let me stop there and ask uh, this little question first. They were going to take narcissistic personality disorder out of the DSM. Uh, I just want to give you a second to think about why that might have been. They obviously left it in, but why might they have taken it out? Well, here it is. Disorders of all kind, personality and just mental disorders broadly, need to be a deviation from the cultural norms of the society that the individual is in. And so we have developed this culture of people who have a grandiose sense of themselves, who have an excessive need for admiration, who think they should only be connected to high status people in institutions, right? Almost, you know, all the way down the list, we can talk about how um, there's been a shift to a narcissism uh, within the culture. And so because of that shift, it became, more, it became more and more difficult to isolate how this was significantly different than the behavior of most people, or at least a lot of people. Um, they eventually left it in. There was, a, there was some infighting about that, some, some people uh, threatening to kind of boycott the DSM, et cetera, it, not just because of that, some other things too, but uh, they were gonna take it out because of this. Uh, and again, this tends to be 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 because we have a society that has the same uh, sense of grandiosity, approaching it at least, and the same uh, need for admiration, and et cetera. So how did those, how did the society get this way? Well, it's <laughs> because uh, of how we've raised this generation and the upcoming generation, perhaps, uh, certainly the previous generation, uh, millennials basically were raised to think that everybody deserves a trophy. Uh, you're special. How dare your teacher talk to you that way, right? All of these things, right? All of these kind of hover parents or uh, bulldozer parents that that uh, come in and make sure that everything is perfect for their for their baby and that they don't get hurt. And you're so special. And how come Sally got a trophy and you didn't? You're only one point behind her, right? This type of thing builds up in this kid this sense that I am do things. I deserve to be admired and respected based on no commiserate experiences, right? Based on the fact that I got third place in the spelling bee, based on the fact that my team lost the baseball game, based on the fact that I know I earned a C, but my mom went in and said I should have got a B plus, so I got a B plus, right? And so this kind of putting a person together to think that you should be given everything, but then to also have this feeling within them that says, but I don't, I don't know that I deserve it, you kind of create this narcissistic personality, right? And that's what we see in culture today is folks needing this admiration, folks wanting to just uh, immediately be successful and folks, uh, you know, expecting that everybody's gonna like their things and getting upset and comparing likes, right? All of this is uh, in the step, <laughs> a step in the direction uh, of narcissism. I also think this might be why um, there's kind of this popular and pop psychology kind of push to think about narcissism as closer to borderline, closer to antisocial uh, personality, because I think it begins to let some people off the hook, right? It begins to make this.